Dr. McNicholas, you've already addressed this issue, but I want to return to it because I think it is critically important. There are some who say that the those who support the abortion procedures are alarmist and exaggerating the uh, danger that women face because of the Dobbs decision. I think you've alluded to this, and I want to make, make it a part of the record. The United States already has the highest maternal mortality rates of comparable nations. In other words, more women die in childbirth in this country than most other countries. We are one of only 13 countries where the maternal mortality rate is worse today than it was 25 years ago. Every year, 900 women nationwide die as a result of pregnancy-related complications. 70,000 suffer near-fatal outcomes. Women of color are three times more likely to die as a result of pregnancy than white women. And yet, it could get much worse. A recent study estimated that a nationwide ban on abortion would increase maternal mortality in the United States by 20%. Among black women, the estimate is an increase of 33%. By ending the constitutional right to abortion, the Supreme Court has ensured that maternal mortality in the United States will increase. In states, incidentally, with the most restrictive abortion laws already, there's a 7% higher maternal mortality rate than states with fewer restrictions. Tell me the practical side of this, the cases that you've run into as a practicing physician, as a doctor, where you had to make this decision, life or death decision when it comes to the mother. Thank you, Senator Durbin. Um, I first want to acknowledge the fact that you're right. This country has a disappointing and quite embarrassing maternal mortality rate already, and we are on the cusp of seeing that rate increase. The six states with the highest maternal mortality rate are six states that immediately moved to ban abortion, and that is not a coincidence. In addition to the public health implications that we won't know for years, uh, impacts on long-term maternal mortality rate, we are already seeing mass chaos among OBGYNs, emergency room physicians, and quite frankly, pharmacists. We're talking about people being denied or delayed care for pregnancy and non-pregnancy related conditions. Lupus, arthritis, cancer, medications that we use frequently to control those conditions are being denied to patients because they might also contribute to miscarriage or can be used for abortion and other indications. OBGYNs who are sitting on patients in emergency rooms while they bleed, while their vital signs become unstable, while they're waiting for hospital lawyers to decide, is this patient sick enough? When the consequence of violating a law is criminal, doctors are put in impossible positions where they know the right care, they know what to do to help somebody, but yet they have to wait, making, making folks sustain totally preventable harm and it is quite embarrassing and should be shameful. Professor Bridges, you made a reference in your testimony to 1868, and you used as an example uh, when Justice Alito referred to the historical precedents and went back to 1868, that at that moment in American history, women were not legally entitled to vote. I also note that and at that moment, women could not own property or enter into a contract in the United States of America. And in 1868, not a single woman practiced law in the United States. And that was the historic basis that Justice Alito wanted to use for the Dobbs decision. Would you comment again on that particular aspect of this when we talk about historic precedent? Absolutely, thank you for the question. Um, it's a complete choice to elevate the year 1868 as the moment of constitutional significance in terms of constitutional interpretation. Again, it was a period of time in which women were not simply not part of the body politic. It wasn't until social movements that occurred later in this country's history in the 1970s that we started to see movements for women's equality and women could actually become something that we can call equal citizens. I also wanted to just give me time to just note the selectivity of Justice Alito's historical inquiry. Um, he chooses to elevate 1868 in the context of abortion rights because it will lead to the result that he likes. In other uh, cases, in other contexts, he doesn't engage in a historical inquiry at all. In his affirmative action jurisprudence, 1868 is also the relevant time that we should look for when interpreting the Equal Protection Clause. Um, we should be interrogating what the framers thought when they passed, when they ratified the Equal Protection Clause in terms of did they think that there ought to be race conscious efforts to make newly, in, uh, newly freed, uh, formerly enslaved people of color members of the body politic. 
If he engages that in historical inquiry, he will have to lead to a conclusion that affirmative action is constitutional. He doesn't engage in that historical inquiry because it will not re lead to the results that he likes. Thank you. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor Stratton, I'm a little over my time, but I want to give you a chance to respond to efforts that are underway on the mater maternal mortality issue and uh, protection of women. And I have to give you fair warning that your statement that Illinois is a unique Midwestern state on this subject is going to be challenged by a senator from Minnesota. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor. Yes. Um, so thank you for that question and just the ability to add uh, what the witnesses have already stated. Uh, in addition to that, I would point out that this will not only just have a disproportionate impact on black women, when we often talk about the issue of maternal mortality, then we raise the issue of how it disproportionately impacts black women, but the issue of restricting abortion access. Uh, the abortion bans and other restrictions also will have a disproportionate impact on those women who are from lower income communities, on immigrant women, on young women, on women from rural communities, on our LGBTQ plus community. There are so many wide ranging ramifications and the bottom line is that everyone should be able to decide for themselves what is best for their own health care in conjunction with their physician. This is not something that should be decided with a political agenda. It is not something that should be a decision made by politicians. These are decisions that are very personal and should be made. And when they have health implications, as we are talking about maternal mortality, then this is an example of why it is not a politician's determination. It should be that individual's decision with their healthcare professional. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor.